Hello, today is January 26th, 2016. I'm meeting today with Mr. Tom Patterson at his home in Fort Collins, Colorado. My name is Brad Hoops. I'm the interviewer for the Northern Colorado Veterans History Project. Welcome, Tom, and thanks for sitting down today to, to tell your story. Let's start out, if we could, tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, your date of birth, where you were born, a little bit about your family. Well, I was born March 12th, 1925 in Kearney, New Jersey. It, where in New Jersey? Kearney, New Jersey. K-E-A-R-N-E-Y. Kearney, New Jersey. My father had built a large building in 1929. And by 1930, he was bankrupt. Oh. That's always a question I like to ask your generation, how your family was affected, if it was, by the Great Depression. My dad lost everything. We had eight homes, lost them all. But my mother had a home. They couldn't, the courts couldn't take that away. So we all moved to New Hampshire and began another life. How many, uh, any uh, siblings? I have uh, two brothers. And uh, one has passed on, and I have a, a sister who's a year and a half younger than me. And, and where'd you fit in that order of siblings? Well, I was number two. Okay. Okay. So uh, your family uh, uh, moved up to New Hampshire then? Yes. And where we had a home that the courts couldn't take away because it was in my mother's name. That must have been some tough years for your for your family, for your folks. Dad had a nervous breakdown. But it was a good life. And it was a rural life. Ah, right. And you went through with a school system up there and, and, uh, and such, graduated from high school up there? Well, I had grades sufficient that they let me start college before I graduated high school. Is that right? The war was on. 30 of us from the state of New Hampshire were allowed to start college in our senior year of high school. So I never did my senior year, but most people, my college was my senior year. Let me back up and ask you, uh, December 7th, 1941, do you know, remember where you were and what you were thinking when you heard about Pearl Harbor? I remember exactly. I was walking down the street in my little town, and I heard the news, and I, I wanted to serve. So my father, I was only 17, yeah. and my father had to, to sign me into the Marine Corps. Now, of all the uh, service branches, how did you come to choose the Marine Corps? I think I was impressed with the uniform. Yeah, <laughs> I hear that quite often. <laughs> That's an honest answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, were you uh, uh, then in college at that point? Had you? No. You had okay. I was in high senior year of high school. Okay. And then and President Roosevelt wanted to build the armed forces up. And he allowed me to start college because I had good grades, mm -hmm. very good grades. Now, how soon after you enlisted did, then did you head off to boot camp, roughly? Well, I, I, I didn't go to boot camp in the normal way. I went to, they sent me to Cornell University in New York. Was it part of one of, like the Navy, uh, one of the Navy V programs or? It was a, it was a V. I think it was E7. Okay. Navy. Okay. But I was in the Marines. Okay. Marines was part of the Navy. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you went off to Cornell. Uh, I got on the honors student list. <laughs> what uh, What did they have you study in there then at Cornell? Was, was, were they sent sending you off on a particular path? Uh, no, they uh, they. They didn't let me choose my subjects. I uh, wanted to be an engineer, so I took engineering courses. Okay. 
And was there any sort of uh, military regime to, or regiment in, in regard to that, or were you just, or were you primarily just a college student? Uh, I was primarily a college student. Okay. So you never had to go through the really through the rigorous boot camp. Uh, that most Marines do, or did you eventually? I did that later. Oh, okay, okay, okay. They sent me to San Diego after the Cornell experience. Now, now, how long were you in at Cornell then? A year. A year, okay. A year and a half, maybe. Okay. Then they sent me to line duty. Uh, I volunteered to go overseas. I came with one man being selected. They had as many as they wanted. But Tarawa, the island of Tarawa. And so this, this is all that. So uh, prior to that, you went out to San Diego, did, did boot camp, and then, and then went uh, overseas? I didn't go into combat. Yeah. They found out I could read maps and make maps. That's what I was assigned to. And the Marines, you do what you're told. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> how, how was, uh, backing up, how was that? Uh, here we got this boy from uh, rural New Hampshire uh, going to sea, going overseas. How was that trip uh, across in the Pacific for you? Did you get your sea legs or how was, uh, do you remember that? Uh, that crossing? Uh. Well, I did cross the ocean. At that point, I crossed the, the America. Because they transferred me to map making for the bombers, to guide the bombers to hit the targets. And the Marines, you do what you're told. Yeah, that's right. So that's what I did. So, okay, so uh, Cornell, uh, just so I get get the order correctly, so from Cornell you transferred out to San Diego? Yeah. And that's where you that did? That was line duty. Okay, okay. And then once from there then you went overseas? I didn't really go overseas. Oh, you didn't? Okay, so you did all, all, all the map? work and, and stuff stayed state at, they, uh, at their location which was Camp Pendleton okay in California okay the largest marine camp in the world right right so you did all, all your work there uh, stateside then okay yeah okay okay I had volunteered to go over right that's what I wanted to do but they said it was more important for me to make maps to guide the bombers. Sure, absolutely. Than it was just go overseas. Right, right. Yeah. And I, I think, uh, if, I, if I'm correct, uh, when we talked a couple days ago off camera, uh, you were involved with the planning of Iwo Jima, the invasion of Iwo Jima, or were you involved with that at all, I thought? Well, yeah, from the standpoint of, of what war were we gonna bomb, we had, I, we had isolated the uh, their people, and, and I made maps then to guide the bombers to the target. And uh, Iwo Jima is 6,000 miles from Japan, but it's in a straight line. <laughs> it was very important. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. We had uh, 33,000 men in our Supersized division, and we took elements of the fourth division, which I was originally in, and put them in the fifth, and made up 33,000 men. We had when we when we took Iwo Jima, we had 18,000 casualties, of which 8,000 were deaths. Mm. The, the Japanese did some things that were terrible. Mm. They they. We found 8,000 dead Marines on the beach. Everyone had their penis cut off mm. and stuffed in their mouth. Mm. It was awful. Because mm. the, the, uh, the troops that uh, had done that were from northern 
Japan, where there's a more militaristic people, all the Japanese aren't that way. Yeah, yeah. As you look back on it now, uh, with all the, the tools you had in, in your map making and, and, and all you've seen in, in the 70 years since then, it seems like I bet that was pretty rudimentary. I mean, did you have, what were you basing your, uh, was it photographs and stuff These that you? Bombers all took photographs and gave them to us and we made maps from the photographs. Okay. So they were pretty accurate. Okay. But it, it, it's probably amazing what you've seen in your lifetime as far as how that's, that's really developed and, you know, satellites and the whole, everything that's developed in map making and, and yeah. just the technology, I would imagine. Uh, yeah. hmm. I developed the equipment that took us to the moon. Yeah, we're going to get into that. Yeah, I definitely, like I said, once we get into the post-war, uh, your post-war life, um, I really want to get into that, uh, absolutely. So getting back, so uh, uh, so after uh, um, Iwo Jima, uh, uh, were you involved in anything with Okinawa as far as that, or was it was your primary, primarily? Iwo Jima. Yeah. Which is a honeymoon place for the Japanese today. They love to come to Iwo Jima really? for a honeymoon. Huh. In, in, in your post uh, military life uh, and travels and such, did you ever get a chance to go to Iwo Jima? I've been there. Have you? Yeah. Oh, yes. Wow. And what, what was that experience? I can't imagine what that experience must have been like for you. Yes. See, see that it still does, yeah, 70 years later, yeah. Hmm. How, how was it, uh, uh, did you enjoy your time in the Marines? Oh, I did. Yeah. yeah. I was very proud to be a Marine. Yes. Yeah. How much, okay, so then the, the war ended, uh, how much longer did you stay in before you were, were discharged then? I had, a, I had a medical discharge in 19, I think it was 1944 or 45. Did you had you ever did you put any had ever put any thought into making it a career or was said no, it was just just wanted to serve and yeah. do your duty and get out? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, let's take your story then uh, post war. So uh, you, you get your discharge. Uh, take your story from there. Then you re return back to New Hampshire. Or? Well, I did visit my father and mother. They lived there. Then I went to Boston University and graduated with honors. Now, were you you took advantage of the GI Bill no, with that? And, and they now, paid for everything. Now, with uh, those prior classes at Cornell, were you able to apply that to your degree, or was that a yes? Okay. Like a year and a half of credits. And the the uh, Marines gave me. I ran out of government money in my senior year and I, I said that we continue to pay it and I could then get my degree on a GI Bill. It was only about six months that they had to cover. And you got your degree in engineering? I got my degree in business management. Oh, business management. But then okay. I, I've spent the rest of my life Managing engineering. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, so you uh, you get out of college, uh, and then where did you go to work, or take us down your career path from there? Well, W. R. Grace wanted me to come with them and go to South America because I had three years of Spanish in college. 
and I ended up going with W.G. Grant. And what did you do for them? Well, I was a training for a store manager. And how long were you there with, uh, with that company? Either three or four years. We've got, uh, you know, just from the research I've done on you, we've got quite a bit of uh, stuff to cover, uh, the various things you developed. Uh, I'd like to talk about your uh, relationship with Peter Drucker. Uh, and so I don't know how, if you want to continue down uh, chronologically uh, down, down the, the road then uh, with your, uh, your career. I, uh, His wife worked with me, Tara Strucker, worked with me for some years. Peter used to stand. The first time he, I went to his home to pick him up, he stood with his arm across the door. He didn't let me in. <laughs> but he, 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 I took him, I picked him up. Uh, I wasn't invited go into his home for some months. And then when I did, it was a hot day, six months later. And uh, he says, why don't you take a swim? I'm in his pool. I said, I don't have a bathing suit. He said, where, where am I? <laughs> so I wore the great pants bathing suit. <laughs> uh, we became great friends. Yes. A long, a long friendship. Oh, yes. Yeah. 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 Doris loved working with me. She was a patent attorney. And he, and he, uh, he thought the world of you uh, in, in your... Uh, he did. The greatest, he thought you were the greatest thinker in the business process. Uh, if I'm, yeah. yeah, so that, that's quite, an, quite a, a statement to be made by him. Yeah. Is that, is that where you first started to, had you had de started to develop your theories or is that where it really kind of started with you or had you done, done that prior to, uh, started doing that prior to meeting Peter? I think Peter had a big influence on the career I took. So I think it was really at the time of Peter Tucker and his friendship is when I began to think about developing. I was always a systems person. I came back to California. And began a career working by myself and eventually built an organization of associates some overseas, some in this country. Drucker mm. saw something in me. We never did discuss it, but he was not close to very many people. He was a writer, probably the greatest business writer that's ever lived. Now, when, when you were working with Peter, uh, was it kind of a, uh, a, uh, a parallel track with your other careers, uh, or were? There was one track, that was the track. Well, I mean, as far as uh, you were working with him, but I know so you, you, uh, reading about you, you also worked for like RCA and, and Walt Disney. I mean, were, were these, were you doing this in parallel with him or was it? Uh, oh, it was parallel. Okay, okay, yeah. And, and talk about some of it. We'll, we'll, we can definitely continue talking about uh, you, you developing your processes and such, but also want to talk about the various things that you were involved in. Uh, uh, 
the DVD, the camcorder, uh, the space program, uh, Walt Disney. I mean, I don't know how we're all going to get it on tape, but uh, but I, I don't know how well, in what order you want to talk about it. But I certainly want to get. Uh, largest construction project in the world at the time was Walt Disney World. So I went to my boss one day, he was across the hall, Ted Smith, who developed the tele he was the, the engineer in charge of the development of television. My hero. And I said, the largest project in the world at this time is Walt Disney World, and I want to be part of it. He said, it's a good idea. He said, what are you going to do to do it? I said, well, I want to go out to Disney. I want to tell them what I can do for them if they let me do all the electronics. It was, I think it, Disney World was like 90 square miles of uh, land. <laughs> he said, what are you going to do to entice them? I said, I'm going to, at the end of my presentation on electronics, I'm going to turn one more page, and then I'm going to, if you do that for me, I'll do this for you. And that became Space Mountain. That's how it was born. Wow. I got $25 million to build it. And they built one in Tokyo, and they went in near Paris, and one in Anaheim, and one in Florida. So they built four space mountains around the world. It's the, it's the number one attraction at Disney, the Space Mountain. Now did, now, did you approach them with that idea, or did they have a rough idea and you refined it, or how did, how did, how did Space Mountain come to be? Well, it was them. I funded it, because uh, my original idea was uh, an RCA attraction and uh, the home of tomorrow. Uh, somewhere around here is a book that I, my present, it's a copy of my presentation. I don't know if I can find it, uh, but uh, I have made a, a copy of the presentation that I made to Disney, and uh, they all got copies of it. I left them with that. Were they, were they initially sold on the idea, or did it take some time, or what? when you gave the presentation, were they sold on the idea right away, or did it, yeah? Well, Roy Disney was, was Walt's brother, mm -hmm. and I showed the attraction. He said, you get me that, stop the meeting. You get me that, Tom. You have any goddamn thing you want. That's what he said. Those are his words. I don't talk like that. Yeah, right. But that was what he said. And I got it for him. That's how Space Mountain was born. Wow. Uh. And at RCA, I had a tough time selling it because there were six of the executive officers of the corporation that told me they were going to kill me, going to kill my project. I said, well, I said, I, we'll see. And I had the the head of NBC sit next to Bob Sarnoff. And then I wrote their script. When I finished my presentation, Bob Sarnoff's script was, he turned to uh, the head of NBC and said, what do you think? And he said, I had written his script. He says, what I think is, there's only one place for us to be at this time in our history. That's with our Disney friends in Florida. 
you got to remember that Disney World, Disneyland, RCA was involved. And every Sunday night, people were watching the Disney show. You probably, your family as well. And while also there, if I'm, if I'm correct, you were involved with the development of the camcorder and the DVD. Was that with RCA? Yeah. I left every company I was ever with with something big. When I was with Douglas, I helped develop the VCA, the first jet aircraft, a commercial jet. Boeing was working on the 707. And when I went to uh, Northrop, I got RCA on the Polaris submarine, the guidance system for the Polaris submarine. And, uh, that took us to the moon. Talk about that, if you would. Well, the fact is that a few years later, I had a, a RCA wanted me to call me. I was with a client in Phoenix. turned white. He says, the president of RCA is on the phone for you. <laughs> and he ran from the room. He was flabbergasted that he had spoken with anyone at that level. <laughs> Nothing new to you, though. <laughs> The president said, Tom, you developed the equipment that took us to the moon. And we made millions of dollars on the uh, contract to take off to the world moon and to return safely. It involved all of that, the whole thing. I would like you to come back with us and head up planning for the corporation and, and do what you did for, for the federal division and the, um, every division. Something big. I said, I can't come back. He said, why? I said, I have. Her daughter is dying. Her wife is, is thinking of committing, committing suicide because she, her girl is dying. Her Debbie Sue died when she was 12. He said, he's making the right decision. Family first. Right. Yeah. Wow. And, and and definitely that's a subject I want to talk about too. Is the fa your family when we get to here uh, in a few minutes? Um, so what I understand with the the, the moon landing uh, that you argued that we weren't quite ready with computers to do that. That you wanted the men to be trained to do that. Is that uh, did I read that correctly? That. Uh, Make it possible. And I'd be 
again, developed all the equipment, mm. and, and it was successful. Oh, you, you, you must have been very proud when you watched that uh, land and, and take off and, and come back and land in the ocean and the whole project. Uh, uh. I was very proud. Wow. But never conceded. Mm. You also have... Uh, Another major invention uh, that's changed the world, uh, the ATM machine. I got the patent, patent on the wall. And I want to see the patent. We'll have to, yeah, we'll look at it here in a, in a minute. Yeah. Uh, that, that's an interesting story. Tell, tell, tell the story how, how you came up with that idea. I used to visit the military labs around the world looking for technology that I could commercialize. And one day I was out at Stanford Research in Palo Alto. And I saw, I was shown a technology that had been developed a hundred years before. It involved etched lines on glass. One glass was that way, one is this way, and one was diagonal. And depending on how you movies, cheese around, and you get different colors. I said, I told the, the, uh, the inventor, I said, that looks to me like the first all color. Tiny. See, it used to be the cameraman with a hundred pounds. They lugged them on their backs and had an associate walk along with them, make sure they didn't fall off. This was a, something new. I understand too. After that meeting, you you were leaving and you didn't have any cash on you, and the banks were already closed. And so you sat out and 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 designed, and then laid out the ATM machine. Then yeah, that's right. <laughs> I came back, went to the RCA laboratories, and worked with an engineer who was used to what the patent office looked for. So I. Patent just sailed right on through. And I got the patent. I, I, yeah. It's what it looks. Okay. Hmm. Boy. Once again, it, it must be another proud accomplishment to, to go past a bank or uh, yeah. at the store and, and, and see one of your machines. <laughs> and, well, my, my thought always was to give employment to people. There must be a few thousand people who make their living on the ATM. <laughs> and that's what drives me, is helping people to have good work. So, it's 
thousands of people maintaining or selling these machines through all over the world now. And, and just the, the convenience that you've brought people, I think, the convenience of the ATM. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Every corner. Yeah. <laughs> Another area, uh, walking down your hallway, the wall of presidents. You've met a lot of presidents. I, from what I read, I've worked with a lot of presidents. Uh, what I understand, Reagan sent you to China to help develop I trade was, with China. Uh, talk working. about your relationship with the various presidents. Well, I don't talk first about Roosevelt, about Reagan. I used to sit alongside him at church on Sunday. I loved the man. He was a great, great president. He says, I want you to go to China and tell the Chinese about democratic capitalism. Most people don't know, but the original capitalists in the world were the Chinese. Then they got communism, but they didn't know about democratic capitalism. So it really confused them. They didn't know how to treat me, but they knew I was coming over as an ambassador. So they gave, they gave me ambassadorial treatment. I've had a good life in many ways. Yeah. I had four children, and three of them died. Yeah, right. So they're gone, and my wife died too. Well, talk, let's back up there. Talk about, uh, tell us about how you met your wife and wooed her, and how, uh, how that all. Well, we were going to high school. I was a freshman, and she was a sophomore. She was ahead of me in my ten year. And uh, we had dances at our high school auditorium on Friday nights. And they cleared the bridge chairs out. Boys sat on one side, girls sat on another. One of the teachers put on Glenn Miller records. I walked across the dance floor and asked this girl to dance. It was Jenny White. I was felt instantly in love. Still in love with her. She's gone. Gone. Thank God I loved her. Uh, but I danced every dance that night with her. My friend dad a few weeks ago called me into the living room and said, son, the whole town was talking. You and Jenny White walking down the street holding hands. I said, I'm going to marry her. He said, you can't possibly know that. I said, well, I'm going to marry her. And I got angry and took a coat hanger and swung it at the radio. Broke it out. My dad didn't know what to do. Hmm. He said, you're not going to, you can't possibly know. You're going to marry her. I said, I do know I'm going to marry her. We were married 54 years. Wow. Now, did, now uh, from high school, then, did, did how I soon? I went into the uh, service. Yeah, how soon? Uh, when did you guys get married then? Were, did, did, was it after your, after your service, or did she follow you? When the car? I was discharged, she married me. Okay, but you kept in touch, obviously kept in touch uh, yeah. during that whole time as you were traveling around we're the country? Engaged. Yeah. Yeah. And you're married 54 years? 54 years. Wow. Never went to bed at night, but always resolved it before we went to sleep. Uh, I loved her passionately. Wow. Still do. Always real. 
and, and from that you, you had four children and then you adopted children as well, correct? Well, when, when our daughter Debbie died, my wife was on the edge of suicide. <laughs> she didn't tell me that, but I, I surmised that and I called her into the living room one night. We were in, living in Valley Forge at the time. And I said, Jenny, I don't know what medicine we should take, but I think we should adopt. She wasn't feeling anything at that time. She says, okay. We adopted three. And we met in New York and split up in two foster homes. We reunited, I think, the whole family. Hmm. There's one more that I wasn't adoptable. It was four in the family, but they wouldn't give me him. I tried several times. They said, he's not adoptable. You lost your daughter to cancer, correct? Yes. Yeah. And then you lost a son to a plane crash? Yes. Yeah. And I lost a son who was killed in the parking lot back in Virginia. He got out of his car to help the car that the one that was stalled. And the car ran into him and threw him up over the front of the car and he died on the way to the hospital. I try to, I tell people, there's nothing that can happen to you that's worse than losing your child. Yeah, can't imagine. It's easier to lose your wife yeah. than a child. Yeah. Uh, my misfortune to lose three of them, three children. But we, I, I adopted a family of three. I got my wife back. She was happy again. She had a family. She was mm -hmm. a mother. Mm -hmm. and she needed children. Mm -hmm. I knew that. Yeah. And she ended up having a good life. Yeah. Mm. <clears throat> well, I'd like to, uh, as we kind of wind down this interview, there's two areas I'd like to talk about. Uh, uh, your business philosophies and, and, and what you developed, and then I know that uh, 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 religion is very important to you. So if you wanted to talk about those two areas. Uh, what was the first one? Talking about how, uh, I, I know you went on to start the, the, the Patterson uh, uh, Foundation, uh, talking about uh, uh, your, your business philosophy uh, and, and processes, uh, I guess. Uh, business philosophy. Always tell the truth. There's never a reason to lie. Don't ever hurt anyone if telling the truth would hurt. Just don't. Into that. I don't think I ever have told a lie. Lies are dead. Now, the, the, the business processes that you've developed over time, do they still stand the, the test of time oh, yes. with, with today's technology? And, uh, There's some 600, at least 600 people on five continents that are making their living with the Patterson process. I'm proud of that. Yeah. I had hoped my son Tom Jr. would 
come in to my business, but he drowned in the lake in Alaska. And uh, Pete is my son now. I asked this, Pete Richardson, I asked his father, do you mind if, if, if Pete is my son too? He said, not at all. <laughs> uh. So can you in 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 can you sum up uh, in I don't know how easy it would be to sum up what the, the Patterson process is is it is it something that can be easily roughly explained? Um, oh yes, absolutely. That's why six hundred people around the world, and it's, it's growing. In another couple of years, we'll have a thousand people who are. Trained and using the Patterson process to help others. It's straightforward. There's no. Well, and what was it like? I, I'm always amazed by your, your generation, what you've seen in your lifetime from really the, the horse and buggy all the way through to, yeah. to uh, the space program to, to, to modern day. Uh, most of us are pretty amazed by it. I think you were, you were always on the cutting edge of following that or ahead of that. So are you amazed in what you've seen in your lifetime or, or, or have you always had a vision that, that that was coming. I think I always had a vision uh, of what was coming. I can never say I was amazed. I look at the moon and I say, I did some of that. I helped. Put people on the moon. One of the astronauts that was on the moon came to one of my meetings in Los Angeles. Told the people what it was like to go to the moon. It's inspiring to think that we have the technology today to do such things. Be being the visionary that you are, what do you see in the future? What, it, it, I, I know that's a very broad question, but uh, uh, what do you see in the future for us uh, as far maybe the space program, technology, uh, uh, humanity? What what do you what what do you see? Is it if that isn't too broad of a question to ask?
do you think we'll ever be able to bring democracy to them? At some point, I don't think I'll be alive. I know I'm going to be alive. Hmm. What, what about space travel? Do you, do you see us going to Mars and, and beyond? Uh, what, what, what do you see in the, in, in the way of space and space travel? Today, in, in your 90s and, and as you uh, in your retirement, what do you think about what 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 goes through your mind? What uh, did I'm sure it's a mind that never shuts down. And St. Peter is saying, you didn't do enough. And I'm saying, if she didn't do enough, why am I in this line? <laughs> That's my dream. Wow. Well, Tom, as we start to wind down this interview, I know we've only got probably the very, very tip of your, of your story. Is there anything I didn't ask you that you wanted to talk about or any, any other stories that have floated to the top as we've been sitting here that you wanted to talk about? So I know, like I said, we only, hopefully we'll round out as best we can, but uh, what did, I know we left so much out, but uh, is, there, is there areas that you want to talk about uh, that, that weren't brought up here in this uh, hour that we've been sitting here? What, what? I'm not discouraged about America. I think it's going to be all right. We're going to be we are the largest democracy in the world. And we've got the right stuff in us. I wanted to see it prevail and spread democracy. But you feel like we still have the right stuff? I, I believe that your generation was coined correctly, the greatest generation. Do we still have what your generation has had? Uh, well, I don't think my generation was the greatest generation. I think we were great, very great generation. But I think that we're going to be
Is there any closing thoughts or philosophies you'd like to, to close with for those, for friends and family that'll, that'll watch this tape? How would you like to close out this, this interview? The words that come to my mind are always tell the truth, but in a very kind way. Never hurt people with the truth. The truth can hurt people terribly. There's a time to tell the truth, and there's a time to be silent. Very good. I'm grateful to live in America. I think we're the greatest nation in the world. Tom, I want to thank you very much for sitting down to tell your story today and for your incredible contribution to humanity. Thank you very much. I've never thought of it that way. <laughs> thank you. Edison had his laboratory, and those are the men that worked in the laboratory. My father is the third one in from the left. Wow. Well, that picture was drawn by Walt, and uh, I'll tell you briefly how Mickey was born. Uh, one day, Walt came into his brother's office, Roy, and said, my dog character isn't working. It still isn't working. I'm going to draw the mouse. Well, the mouse was a little mouse that crept on his desk every night and waited for a piece of bread. And Walt would carefully open his wax paper sandwich and with a pencil push the bread toward the mouse and the mouse would stay there and eat it. And so he drew the mouse and became Mickey. <laughs> wow. Huh. The Wall of Presidents. One of our great heroes is Churchill. I have slept in his bed, in his home. Did you ever have a chance to meet him? I saw him in person. Oh. I didn't meet him, I don't think. Wow. to management sciences. Hmm. A Nobel laureate. What was it, what was this award for, Tom? I have to take my contributions to management science. Like hmm. it says. <laughs>